Hello everyone. Uh, I cordially welcome you all on behalf of COEC PIX IIT Madras. I would like to extend my warm greetings to Dr. Joshi Tomo Okawachi from uh, Columbia University. Currently, he is a research scientist in Applied Physics and Applied Mathematics Department. Uh, Dr. Joshi will give a talk on on-chip uh, nonlinear non photonics. Before having this interesting topic, I would like to request Professor Vijay Krishna Das to introduce our honorable speaker. And I will also request uh, Professor Sudarshan and Srinivasan to moderate our Q&A session. Over to Professor Das. I once again welcome you all for this uh, sixth seminar, uh, webinar talk, of course. Yeah. And uh, we are really glad uh, to have our uh, speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Yoshimo Ositomo Okawachi. And uh, just it is my pleasure to introduce him in front of you. Uh, he is actually fondly known as uh, Yoshi. His friends normally call him as Yoshi. So I'd be just uh, addressing him like that. So Yossi uh, did his uh, BS degree in engineering physics and uh, it was completed in 2002 and then uh, PhD in applied physics in 2008, uh, both from uh, Cornell University USA. And right away, uh, he is a research scientist in the department of applied physics and applied uh, mathematics at Columbia University. And uh, his research areas uh, include uh, so-called optical frequency comb generation in silicon-based uh, waveguides and micro-regenerators, uh, coherent computing based on uh, degenerate optical parametric oscillation, again in micro-regenerators, and parametric nonlinear interaction in photonic devices, slow light, and all optical signal processing using space-time duality, duality techniques. So all uh, related to nonlinear uh, photonics and mostly uh, in, in the silicon and Kaikri process. And Dr. Okawachi is the uh, recipient of the uh, 2007 uh, Tingye Lee Innovation Prize. And uh, he has published more than 80 uh, peer-reviewed journal papers and co-inventor of uh, three patents. And uh, he has served uh, as a program committee, uh, technical program committee member uh, in several uh, uh, recognized uh, conferences in the area of optics and photonics, such as uh, Clio, FIO, uh, LAS, SCP, and Clio Pacific Rim. And uh, also, uh, he also contributed, uh, he's, he has been contributing uh, for uh, reviewing uh, journal papers. And so, almost 26 peer reviewed journal papers he is contributing uh, for with his expert uh, review comments. Currently, he is the associate editor of the uh, uh, Optics Letters. So, that is a highly high impact factor uh, journal. And uh, he is also vice chair of the Optica Ultrafrost Optical Phenomena Technical Group and the chair of the Integrated Photonics Technical Group. Uh, he is an Optica Fellow and served as the 2017 uh, Optica Ambassador. So earlier it was OSHA, Optical Society of America. Recently it has been uh, converted into Optica, known as Optica, so Optica Ambassador. And uh, he will be uh, talking, he will be presenting uh, today, as you see uh, the title, On-Chip Nonlinear Photonics. And in the panel uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Sudarshan and Srinivasan will be uh, uh, moderating. So you can, uh, whoever uh, actually register participants and directly watching this, you can put up your questions. It can be interactive and uh, you can directly ask question if needed. Uh, otherwise, uh, Dr. Sudarshan will forward that question uh, to uh, Dr. Rossi. And uh, there is a three dots in the right hand side. There, if you click, there will be a Q and A uh, box will be there. There you can put up your questions. And other than uh, that, we have our uh, chief technology officer, Arnav Goswami, also there in the panel, and the moderator already uh, there. 
and uh, I see also another one uh, uh, renowned engineer. Uh, I see uh, Vivek Raghunathan. Uh, he's also uh, there in the panel. Vivek, if possible, if you can uh, just uh, just switch on your video, I think he can also participate uh, in the panel discussion while the Q and A session. And uh, yeah, with this, uh, I just uh, uh, and over to uh, Yossi. You see, it is now stage is yours. Uh, please entertain us for next forty five minutes to one hour, and then following that, we can have some Q and session. I think uh, that is that would be more interesting, I guess. So, over to you, Yossi. Yeah. Hey, um, thank, thanks so much for the kind introduction, and you know, thanks to everybody at uh, IIT Madras for uh, the invitation as well. Really excited to be here. Um, so let me just share my screen. Can everybody see the yeah the, the slide? Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, so today I'll be talking about you know some of the I, I guess the research that we've been doing um over the past like five ten years or so on um integrated. Uh, nonlinear photonics. Um, so this was worked on at Columbia University, um, in in uh, Alex Gaeta's lab, um, in very close collaboration also with um, Michal Lipson's group, also at Columbia. Okay, so um, nonlinear optics. So nonlinear optics is the the study of um, light matter interactions, where the optical field is strong enough such that you can actually change the material properties. So on the microscopic scale, you can model this using a Lorenz atom model. So you know if you have a um, an electric field that's incident on an atom, that that actually will result in an induced di dipole, and the restoring force um, that you can see here um, is a nonlinear function of the displacement of that electron. So this particular restoring force is related to the polarization. And um, you can solve for the polarization using a, a power series expansion, if you will. So if you take a look, you basically have this uh, second and third term here that correspond to uh, the second and third order nonlinearities, and those are essentially what will um, result in the generation of new frequencies. So for most of this talk, I'll be talking about uh, chi three nonlinearities in this case, and um, one of the you know the key nonlinear interactions that I'll be I'll be mainly discussing today is um, parametric Fourier mixing. So um, Fourier mixing is a, again, a third order nonlinear interaction. In this case, two pump photons annihilate to create the signal Euler photon pair. Um, so in order to have very efficient uh, Fourier mixing process, you, you need two things. One is energy conservation, which effectively defines the frequencies that are involved. And then you have momentum conservation, or you know, I guess more known as phase matching. So typically, in order to have um, you know parametric gain, uh, you require operation where the group velocity dispersion is less than zero, which is the anomalous uh, dispersion regime. So uh, a key enabling uh, development for efficient nonlinear interactions is the implementation of a waveguide geometry, whether it's you know an integrated or a fiber. So if you take a look at the nonlinear parameter or the nonlinear phase shift, um, you can see that it's linearly dependent on the power and also the interaction length. Um, and then you can also see it's inversely dependent on the area. So, you know, if you compare to a focusing geometry in a bulk media, the waveguide can allow for a much longer interaction length, which also, you know, effectively helps to reduce the power requirements as well. <clears throat> so, integrated photonics takes this even a step further. Um, there, there's been, you know, I, I guess if you, if you look, at, look back at the past 5, 10, 15 years or so, there's been a tremendous amount of um, advances in fabrication technology that has led to a development of, you know, numerous photonic platforms for nonlinear optics, you know, including silicon, silicon nitride, um, aluminum nitride, lithium niobate, you know, the, the list goes on, right? Um, so today I'll be focusing on silicon nitride. Um, so if you take a look at uh, uh, silicon nitride itself, the nonlinearity is actually pretty high. It's about 10 times larger than that of silica glass. Um, and if you take a look at this waveguide cross section here, um, you have quite a high index contrast between the silicon nitride core and the, the surrounding oxide cladding. So this this contrast allows for a very tight optical confinement, such that you can have you know waveguide geometries that are sub uh, sub wavelength in in dimension. So not only does this mean that you can have very compact structures, you know, with fairly sharp bends, um, but also this 
the small um, waveguide area allows for an enhanced nonlinearity since you know the effective nonlinear phase shift is inversely proportional to the the area. So this was work that was led by um, uh, Xing Chen Ji from um, Michal Lipson's group at Columbia. Um, so you know again this this is really a result of the the, the tremendous advances in fabrication and processing technology. Um, it's possible to now have silicon nitride wave guys with very low propagation losses of you know let, uh, about 0.4 dB per meter. So what this means is on, on this very tiny you know um, um, you know few millimeter wave, uh, uh, chip chip dimension, you can have you know tens of centimeters of waveguide length to do you know efficient nonlinear optics, delay lines, and so forth. Um, uh, last but not least, um, again, this tight optical confinement leads to a very large contribution from the waveguide dispersion. So what this means is what we can do is just by changing the waveguide cross section, um, you can access, you know, a, a lot of different kind of dispersion profiles. And this is actually very critical for, you know, phase batch nonlinear processes, such as for mixing. So uh, here's the outline of my talk. Uh, so I'll start by talking about Kirkholms. I'll give a background, uh, talk about some of the work on silicon nitride and near IR, and also talk about some of our more recent work on synchronization. And then uh, switch gears and talk about uh, degenerate optical parametric oscillators. So these are all both in uh, silicon nitride microresonators. So um, optical frequency combs are defined as a spectrum of regularly spaced discrete lines. So you have two parameters that define this. One of them is the delta F or the comb spacing. And then you have the, the uh, FCO, which is the carrier envelope offset frequency. So by knowing these two parameters, you can effectively know the absolute frequency of all the different um, and, you know, frequency components that are generated. And you can, you can think of it as um, a frequency ruler for you know, a variety of applications. Um, and also because of the 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 you know the the comb spacing, you can actually also create a, a direct link between an op, uh, between the optical and microwave domain. So uh, comb te technology has become quite mature over the past ten years or so, and there's been numerous uh, applications that have come out of it, including uh, molecular spectroscopy, ultrafast ranging, optical frequency th synthesizers, atomic clocks. Uh, communication, OCT, uh, microwave generation, and so forth. So there's also been, you know, a lot of commercial development as well. Um, so there's been a lot of tabletop, um, you know, commercial products that have come out, including Menlo System, Toptica, Imra, and so forth. Um, so in our research, what we want to do is take this very large, you know, um, you know, tabletop kind of scale. Uh, frequency comb and make it into this, you know, centimeter uh, footprint, uh, so that we can, you know, realize a handheld uh, 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 frequency comb source with applications, for example, in WDM or lab on a chip. So uh, Kirkholm generation typically relies on high Q microresonators. The cavity-free spectral range is typically in the range of 10 gigahertz up to a terahertz. Um, the process uh, relies on uh, forward mixing parametric oscillations um, initiated by a single frequency pump laser. So, you know, as the pump is tuned into the, the cavity resonance, um, the power builds up. And these, um, once the parametric gain exceeds the losses, you start getting parametric oscillation where you generate these sidebands. So, with further power buildup, you can get high order forward mixing processes to occur that allow you to, you know, fully fill in all the resonances to generate this. Uh, Kerr uh, frequency comb. So there's been a lot of work done both uh, experimentally and theoretically on Kerr combs. Um, and um, for, for, for theoretical modeling, uh, you can use the Lugiato Lefebvre equation that's given here. Um, so the first term is the, the pump field. Um, they have the propagation and coupling losses here. And then uh, this delta naught is the pump cavity detuning. Um, and you have all the different orders of uh, dispersion and the nonlinearity here. Um, so here's a, a simulation of the comb generation dynamics. Uh, so this is uh, operating in the anomalous group velocity dispersion regime. So as you tune in, you start seeing these uh, primary sidebands form. This is also known as a Turing pattern. And then with more tuning, you transition into this chaotic, like uh, very noisy state. 
Um, so by, by further tuning the, the, the pump into resonance, you can actually transition into a, a multi-pulse state where the pulses start to annihilate. Um, so these, these uh, temporal pulses in this case are known as uh, dissipative crystallotons. And uh, there are stable localized structures that, uh, that arise, arise between the balance between loss and gain and dispersion and nonlinearity. And then finally, you know, you, as you can see here, you can transition into the single soliton state where you basically have one pulse that is circulating in, uh, around that microresonator cavity. So, um, so the, the, the simulation I just showed basically is, uh, op again, operating in the anomalous group velocity dispersion regime. Um, so you can uh, basically um, realize this by engineering the cross-section of the waveguide such that you have this broad region of anomalous group velocity dispersion um, around the pump. And this, again, is a dissipative of cursed soliton. And, you know, th this is a, a specific kind of uh, solution to the, the Lujala favor equation uh, that arises due to the balance between the loss and the parametric gain and also the balance between dispersion and nonlinearity. So, um, uh, so these these are these are some of the the platforms that have been actually demonstrated um, for Kirkholm generation. Uh, there's actually even more to this list. That, um, I haven't been able to fully, you know, fill it in all the screen, I guess. Um, but you know, the the original work was pioneered by Tobias Kippenberg's group in silicon microtoroids. Um, there's been a lot of other groups that have um, worked, for example, on uh, uh, the fluorides, the quartz and NIST and OE waves and so forth. Uh, uh, for integrated platforms, uh, there's been development in high index glass, uh, silicon nitride, silicon, diamond, and also more recently, um, you know, it, uh, there, there's been exciting materials that also exhibit Chi2 um, properties, including aluminum nitride, lithium niobate, and aluminum gallium arsenide. There's also been a lot of different approaches for, for tuning um, and generating the Kirkholms. So, you know, there's the traditional approach of um, uh, laser tuning, um, pump power tuning, um, you know, phase modulation using pulse pump. So, um, in our group, uh, what we've been doing is uh, resonance tuning using the thermal optic effect. So, what we do is use these um, uh, deposit, these uh, platinum resistive uh, heaters directly on top of the waveguide. So, you can see that in this microscope image. Um, with the, the, the structure here um, that's kind of in white. Um, so what we can do is, you know, thermally tune the cavity of re resonance uh, towards a fixed laser um, and to initiate the comb generation process. Um, and we see that, you know, in, even in silicon nitride, the thermal resp response time is fairly fast on the order of about 20 microseconds. So, you know, we can readily tune into that soliton state. So, Here's a typical experimental uh, generation di dynamics for soliton load locking in silicon nitride. Um, so the left here shows the optical spectrum, and then the, the right is the corresponding RF spectrum. So as you tune into resonance, uh, just like in the theory, you start uh, getting these primary sidebands or Turing rolls to form. And then with further tuning, you get into this fully uh, natively uh, spaced comb to form, but you can see uh, in the RF spectrum, you have quite a uh, large RF amplitude noise. So we, we, we call this like the chaotic like behavior. And then with further tuning, you can transition to into a phase lock state where the RF noise, you know, significantly drops. Um, and then you can access also this multi soliton state where you have multiple solitons propagating in the cavity. And then finally, this single soliton state, which is natively spaced. So more recently, we've been able to take this technology further and basically interface a high Q silicon nitride microresonator with a with an RSOA uh, device so that we can have both the the laser and the Kirkholm on the chip. So uh, this was work that was led by Brian Stern and Michal Lipson's group, where the the RSOA chip um, that's kind of here is, is uh, pumped electrically, and then um, you know the, the the coupling between the RSOA chip and the nitride chip. Uh, is such that you can get optical feedback from the high Q microresonator to go all the way back into the RSOA, which allows for lasing, uh, that's shown here, and then uh, subsequent soliton formation. Um, so, you know, this is a fairly efficient process, and you can actually uh, drive the RSOA with a single AAA battery. And, you know, the, the compact uh, nature of this system, uh, we think that it has quite a lot of potential for, you know, realizing a chip scale WDM source for datacom. And uh, you know, there, there's been you know 
a lot of work on this recently um, on this full integration of a Kirkholm, also by Carrie Valhalla's group at uh, Caltech, John Bauer's group at UCSB, and also Tobias Kiffenberg's group at EPFL. So uh, there, there, is, there are some drawbacks of using solitons, however, um, and one of the main issues is the, the low uh, pump to comb conversion efficiency that you get um, for you know, dissipative curve solitons. Uh, so typically conversion efficiency is limited to a few percent. Um, the plot on the bottom shows uh, um, the theoretical and experimental characterization of conversion efficiency as a function of the resonator free spectral range. Uh, so, if you take a look at the critical coupling conditions between the, the, the bus waveguide and the resonator, um, the efficiency scales as the square root of the free spectral range. And you can see even if you, as you go up to, you know, high FSRs of uh, 600 gigahertz, the efficiency is still less than 3%. So, you can, you can certainly improve this by operating the overcoupling regime, overcoupled regime, but the efficiency even there is still limited. So. You know, we've been looking into some alternative approaches for in, uh, improving this point. Um, yeah, so you, know, you can actually generate uh, Kirkholms also in the normal group velocity dispersion uh, regime as well. Um, this is an area that uh, a lot of different groups are getting into, and uh, recently it's been shown that you can get very high conversion efficiencies beyond 40% operating in this regime. Um, but typically, operating in the normal group velocity dispersion regime is not ideal for phase matching um, uh, for a mixing interactions. So you, you typically need either a, a mode interaction to locally shift the resonances or to use some sort of laser injection locking. So this is how it works. So in our case, we use mode coupling. And what happens is that the interaction that you get between the two interacting modes results in the splitting in the resonance like shown here. So if you take a look at the, you know, the local shift in resonance, um, you can see that the, the position of the resonance is shift, uh, like you, you can see down here. And that actually, the, that shift actually allows for phase matching to generate modulation and stability sidebands, which help to facilitate cone formation. So, you know, there, there's a lot of different approaches that you can use to do uh, mode interactions. You can use you know, coupling between different uh, spatial modes in the, the resonator. You can use different polarization. Um, and what we did uh, in this case is use a, a coupled ring geometry where you have a, a main resonator and a bus resonator, uh, and an auxiliary resonator. So um, here, here's a typical uh, microscope image of the, the coupled ring resonator that we use. So we have the bus waveguide like this. And then we have the, the main resonator where a uh, large amount of the power is. And then you have this auxiliary resonator in order to create this mode interaction. So uh, just like in the, the soliton case, we have these um, integrated resistive heaters. Um, so that, that actually can control the, rel uh, the, the position of the, the, the resonance uh, frequencies of the auxiliary and main resonators. And that actually is what allows for controlling the, the location of the mode crossing as well. So here's a plot of the, the normal GVD uh, comb generation dynamics. So what we do in this case is we start by tuning the auxiliary ring resonance uh, such that we have the mode crossing position very close to the pump. And then what we do is um, you know, reduce the heater power um, on the main uh, ring resonance in order to generate the, the comb. So you know, the plot here basically shows the generation dynamics as we reduce the heater power. So you can see, you basically see the, the primary sidebands generating kind of similar to the Kirk, uh, the Salton Kirkholms. Um, and then you also get into this high noise state and finally this uh, low noise phase locked uh, normal GVD comb. So you can see here on the bottom of the spectral evolution that, you know, there's actually a quite a large range of heater powers where you can actually sustain this normal GVD comb. And the, this, this actually uh, allows us to, you know, uh, reach this um, uh, turkey operation state where we can just, uh, you know, use a computer, pro uh, computer program to basically generate this comb generation re repeatedly. So here's a, a typical spectrum um, that we get uh, from the normal GVD comb. So we basically have 180 milliwatts of pump power um, in the bus waveguide to do this, and we get about a 41% pump to comb conversion efficiency. So you know you can see here there's quite a lot of lines here above one milliwatt in this case. So you know we we get a, a quite a large efficiency compared to the few percent 
that you can get in solid ponds. And we think that uh, this approach will be more ideal for being able to realize a, uh, a, a WDM source um, potentially for communication applications. So, you know, we've been continuing to look at other ways of being able to improve the cone line power. And then another approach that we've looked at is uh, using synchronization. So, you know, the synchronization phenomenon itself is quite ubiquitous in uh, nature. Uh, this was first reported by uh, Christian Huygens in 1665. Basically have, um, you know, two pendulum uh, clocks that are suspended um, um, under a wooden beam. And it turns out that the, the coupling you get from the small vibrations in that wooden beam allow for the, the, the period of the two pendulum clocks to become mutually locked. So uh, there's a lot of different areas um, uh, where you can actually see synchronization. Uh, you can also see this in uh, nature in the flashing of fireflies, uh, crickets chirping, um, uh, pacemakers and uh, mammals' hearts. You know, you can see it in physics and Joseph's injunctions, coupled lasers. Uh, there's actually a very nice paper um, by C. Shogads at Cornell that reviews uh, synchronization of coupled oscillators and the Kuramoto model for synchronization. Um, so in, 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 this, uh, in this work, we'll be focusing on, you know, the synchronization of optical frequency combs. So um, here's the illustration of the concept. So you can consider two nearly identical microresonators for, for generating Kerr combs um, using the same CW laser. But, um, you know, whether it's due to fabrication tolerances or environmental fluctuations or even, you know, temperature gradients, um, the, the, the comb spacing or the repetition rate is different between the primary comb and the secondary comb. So what you can do in this case is just um, introduce a small coupling signal, less than 1% of the power. Uh, you can couple it from the, the primary comb to the secondary comb, and you can actually synchronize the timing of the solitons, meaning that you can lock the repetition rate. So if you take a look at the, the mathematical model, um, so if you, uh, you can compare the evolution of the temporal position of the secondary uh, cavity soliton, and that ex expression looks quite like the universal synchronization model that was developed by Yoshiki Kuramoto. So, um, and here's our experimental results. So what we do is combine the, uh, the output um, from the primary and secondary combs and send it to an optical spectrum analyzer and an RS spectrum analyzer. So um, the first case is where the, the coupling is turned off. And here on the OSA, we basically just get, um, you know, incoherent addition of the two comb lines. Um, the, the combs have a slightly different spacing, um, which, you know, cannot be resolved with an OSA, but the, that, that repetition rate difference shows up as beat notes in the RF domain that's shown here. So then when you turn the, the, the coupling signal on, uh, you start seeing modulations in the optical spectrum that comes from the interference between the two combs. You can also see that the beat note just disappears from the fact now from the fact that the comb lines are overlapped in frequency, meaning the repetition rates of the two combs are now synchronized. So <clears throat> we've also extended this study into the normal group velocity dispersion regime. Um, and we've been able to show synchronization of the two normal GVD combs that we showed earlier. And again, the, the amount of um, power that we, we send in is again about 1%. Um, so, you know, once the repetition rates are matched, what we can do is tune the relative path length of the two ar output arms. And that, what, what that can allow for is coherent combining to be able to increase the power of the, the effective comb by more than a factor of two. Um, so we're currently working on um, on-chip coherent combining, um, where we, we basically have a fully integrated version of this, where we have, you know, the, both, both the primary and secondary comb, along with this coupling link, all on one chip. So as the demand for um, energy-efficient um, high bandwidth communication goes up, we feel that, uh, you know, Kirk homes can be a, a particularly a viable solution for being able to realize massively parallel WDM transmission. So um, we believe that, you know, by using an uh, aggregated comb source, um, we can implement um, a scalable approach for future data centers, um, um, enabling multi-terabit scale chip-to-chip -chip links, connecting, you know, high bandwidth uh, memory stacks to graphic proce uh, graphics processing units. 
So here's an overview of the scalable architecture uh, to, to be able to increase the number of usable channels on an integrated transmitter chip. Uh, this was work that was led by Karen Bergman's group, uh, also at Columbia University. <clears throat> so the link in this case um, uses a, 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 a Kirkholm normal GVD comb as a WDM source, which is sent to a, the transmitter chip. So the comb interleaving and the interleaving in this case is done using a, a resonator assisted Moxender interferometer. And this essentially allows for reducing the number of cascaded modulators that are on a single bus. So the receiving link is also similar and basically have the, the D interleaver here and um, an, uh, an array of cascaded uh, photodiodes um, on each of these buses. So today I'll be focusing on the transmitter chip. So um, this, this fabricated chip here is a, a 32 channel transmitter chip on a footprint of you know, 1.1 millimeters by 4.15 millimeters. So this was fabricated in a commercial 300 millimeter foundry and with electrical and optical pack, pack, packaging done by Optelligent. So <clears throat> the bottom here shows the, the setup. Again, the, this, this section here is the, the normal GVD comb generator. So then that's again sent into the, the, the transmitter chip. So this um, 96 channel um, source measurement unit essentially is providing the, the, the bias. And uh, what we do is send in a, a PRBS uh, 31 signal uh, uh, into the modulators for BER testing. And then the modulated comb output is uh, collected with fiber and sent into the receiver, which consists of you know, a photodiode and a trans impedance amplifier. So that electrical signal um, that's generated here is sent into a real-time real oscilloscope for um, eye diagram characterization and also um, a BERT for doing the bitter array testing. So here's the, uh, uh, the results of the 32-channel transmitter. Um, so <clears throat> you can see from the, the eye diagrams here that for both 10 gigabit per second and 16 gigabit per second, um, all the modulators display an open eye and been able to see a 100% yield for the, the photonic devices on that chip. So um, the BR measurement to the right here um, show that at both 10 gigabit and 16 gigabit, all the comb lines uh, show a BR better than 10 to the uh, minus eight, with most being better than 10 to the minus nine. So, you know, again, with further link optimization, you know, we really think that Kirkholms offer promise as a next generation WDM source you know, to replace the currently used laser arrays with a single module. Okay, so I uh, just wanna switch gears here now and talk about the degenerate OPO. Um, so I, I already talked about Kirkholms earlier, which, you know, again, are initiated by parametric oscillation, right? So you basically start with a single pump and generate the signal neither pair sidebands. So uh, now I'll be talking about the degenerate optical parametric oscillator where you can generate a, a frequency degenerate uh, signal in either pair. So uh, degenerate OPOs have been demonstrated both in CHI-2 and CHI-3 media. So in CHI-2, it works through the process of difference frequency generation, where you start with a single pump and then generate a you know, frequency degenerate signal in either pair like this. Um, you can also do this in a CHI-3 medium, where you have uh, you know, two, two pumps that are frequency non-degenerate and then generate this um, frequency degenerate signal nylar pair right in between. Um, so um, it turns out that when the degenerate OPO reaches this oscillation threshold though, um, it undergoes this binary phase transition. So um, what happens in this case is the signal um, phase locks of the pump with one of two possible states that are offset by pi. Um, so, you know, th this, this largely comes from the phase matching conditions that are shown here. So, you know, in the CHI-2 case and CHI-3 case, you can see that there's this factor of two in front of the signal phase. So, you know, you can see that you, know, you can have a, a zero or pi offset um, and you can still get the same exact phase matching conditions and that allows for the, the, the rise in this biphase state. So, um, you know, you can consider these two different states, so zero phase to be spin up or spin down. So you can think of this as effectively an artificial photonic spin. Um, one of the nice um, aspects of degenerate OPOs is that since the OPO is initiated from quantum noise, 
the the photon spins that are uh, that are produced are intrinsically unbiased, and that allows us to do you know a lot of cool things with it. Um, so just a quick quick theory um, on chi, chi three degenerate POs. So in order to uh, get the get the degenerate PO to work, you you basically have to have maximum gain at that frequency degeneracy point. So you can also model this using the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, where you have the, you know, this is just beta two, the group velocity dispersion, and you have gamma, which is the nonlinear parameter. So uh, you want to take a look at the parametric gain uh, for, for two pumps. So uh, what we do is define two parameters here. Uh, the dispersion length is given by this expression where delta corresponds to the, the offset between the, the pump and then the degener uh, degeneracy point. Um, beta 2 is the group velocity dispersion, and then you have gamma, again, is the nonlinear parameter for defining the nonlinear length. Uh, P, in this case, is the pump power. So here's the plot of the gain for two pumps um, for both normal and anomalous group velocity dispersion. So you can see in the top uh, left corner here, when the dispersion length is larger than the nonlinear length, you can actually get the condition where you have the maximum gain at the degeneracy point. And this is the, the operating condition that we want to use for achieving the degenerate OPO. So uh, first, we wanted to experimentally verify that we have a biphase state. So we modulate one of the pumps using an acousto-optic modulator uh, such that each pulse uh, generates uh, its own degenerate OPO state. So the repetition rate in this case also the and also the pulse duration is chosen such that the OPO, um, after it's generated, can decay all the way back down to noise before the next pulse comes, and that, that time scale is largely dependent on the cavity decay rate. So the bottom plot here uh, shows the typical uh, OPO spectrum, where again, the two high peaks correspond to the pump, you, know, you can have this OPO spectrum right in between. So in order to characterize the, the biphase state, what we do is send the output to an asymmetric mox ender interferometer, uh, and what we, we use that to measure the relative phase between the adjacent pulses that are generated. So here's here's our, our temporal measurement. So what we do in this case is about 217,000 phase measurements uh, to show two distinct states. So the top one is basically the a tap signal from one of the arms of the mock sender, and the bottom one is the the measured interference. So you can see, you know, we basically have these two states: um, the high peaks corresponding to constructive interference, and the low peak corresponding to destructive interference. So we can indeed verify experimentally that we, we are indeed generating a biphase state. So, you know, actually what we can do is assign, you know, ones and zeros to the constructive and destructive interference. And uh, we've been able to also realize a, a random number generator, in this case at a two megahertz uh, generation rate. <clears throat> so random numbers are, you know, a critical component for you know, a variety of applications recently, including, uh, Cryptography, Monte Carlo simulations, gaming, and so forth. Um, uh, typically, the requirement for randomness is both uh, uni uniformity, meaning that you have as many ones and zeros, and also independence, meaning that each bit is uncorrelated from the previous bit. So, you know, in order to realize a random number generator, you require a high quality entropy source. And there's been a lot of um, uh, optical approaches for generating this, including um, amplified spontaneous emission. Um, phase noise measurements, uh, photon arrival time, spontaneous Raman scattering, and also photon num number path um, entanglement. So the approach that we've been using is uh, using the degenerate OPO. And again, one of the nice aspects about uh, degenerate OPO is, you know, we're actually measuring a classical signal since we're operating above threshold. And also since um, the, the process is initiated from noise, it's uh, intrinsically unbiased. So in our previous approach that I showed a couple of slides ago, we basically used an off-chip acousto-optic acousto modulator to amplitude one, uh, modulate one of the pulses to generate these bits. So we wanted to do further integration, integration. So what we wanted to do is bring the modulation element on chip. So to do this in silicon nitride, uh, what we do is drive the integrated heaters with uh, uh, thermal, uh, thermal tuning in order to, you know, get the uh, control the resonance position for generating the, the turning on and off the OPO. So if you take a look at the single device, um, 
you know, if you, so if you modulate with, you know, using uh, the thermal optic effect, what happens is all the resonances shift together. So the, the cavity decay rate in this case is inversely proportional to the Q factor. So in order to speed up that, that process, what we consider is a coupled ring geometry. So in this case, what we do is, um, you know, you use the mode interaction so that we can implement the avoided mode crossing at that degenerate OPO mode. So what we can do is tune uh, in and out that uh, mode crossing position to turn on and off the OPO. And, you know, in, in this case, what happens is not only do you introduce loss, but you can also introduce a local uh, localized change in the dispersion as well and allow for dynamic control of the photon lifetime. So here's the device. Um, so you know we we designed this coupled microresonator to have a normal group velocity dispersion. The free spectral range also in this case is 200 gigahertz. Um, and we, we for for this device, um, when the auxiliary ring is uh, positioned far away in terms of the resonance, we measure a load of Q of about 720,000, which corresponds to a photon lifetime of 480 picoseconds. Um, and again, um, the, these, these pads here and the, are, are the integrated heaters um, that we can use to control the position of the, the main and auxiliary ring resonances and effectively control the position where the mode interaction occurs. So here's the generated OPO from the, the coupled ring device. So the high peaks again correspond to the pump and we have the OPO generated in between at 1549.4 nanometers in this case. So, you know, to now to turn on and off the, the OPO, we drive the heater on the auxiliary ring uh, using these RF pulses. Um, you know, again, we choose the, the pulse duration and also the repetition rate in this case so that we can suppress each of the OPOs down to the noise level. Um, here's the uh, temporal measurement. So again, just like before, you can assign uh, one to the constructive interference and zero to the low peaks for destructive interference. And for this case, we're able to achieve a generation rate of about 505 kilobits per second. And so in order to verify that we have um, good random numbers, um, we took a 101,000 um, bit sequence and sent it to the NIST uh, statistical test feed uh, to test for both uniformity and independence. So here are the test results. Um, so p-value in this case uh, measures the uniformity and proportion measures the independence. And we see that, um, you know, our, our test sample satisfies both uniformity and independence for all the statistical tests, indicating that we can, you know, generate good random numbers. So we've also performed um, uh, modeling of the photon lifetime in both the single and coupled ring uh, system. So the plot, um, the black curve here shows the single ring and the red one is the coupled ring for similar to our experimental conditions. So um, 1.5 million Q in this case uh, corresponds to the intrinsic, um, sorry, uh, so the, 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 the one Q of 1.5 million corresponds to experimental conditions. And in this case, we see a 3.7 times decrease in the photon lifetime indicating that, you know, in principle, we should be able to reach generation rates of about 680 kilohertz. So um, you can further in, uh, uh, achieve an even larger reduction um, by using a strong, stronger drop port coupling, which is this blue curve. And uh, for this case, we're able to see uh, an even larger factor of a uh, factor of 16 reduction, which means that we can uh, reach generation rates of three megahertz. And you can see the scaling is even better when you go to higher Qs, meaning that we can we can also use lower pump powers as well. So, you know, while silicon nitride is limited ultimately by the thermal tuning speed, you can imagine you can generate uh, random numbers at an even faster rate by using faster tuning mechanisms like uh, carrier injection in silicon or the electro electro optic effect in Chi two materials as well. So, you know, we, we think that this could be a, um, an interesting approach for being able to uh, generate a chip scale uh, entropy source. So the last part of the talk, uh, I want to talk about the coherent Ising machine. So um, the Ising model originally was developed um, for modeling phase transitions and ferromagnetism. Um, this can be characterized by a Hamiltonian where you basically have these sigma terms correspond to the spins, and then Jij in this case corresponds to the coupling between the, the different spins. So uh, it turns out um, finding the ground state of such a system 
corresponds to uh, a, a MP hard type computation problem. And you can use polynomial time mapping and actually map to other MP completed problems as well. So the, the Ising machine falls under a category of computing accelerators. And there's been a quite a, a bit of interest in developing uh, these kind of accelerators for solving uh, combinatorial optimization problems where the problem solves uh, problem scales both uh, exponentially both in time and energy. So there's been a lot of different applications here, including uh, artificial intelligence, bioinformatics, cryptography, and so forth. Um, so th this this is this uh, concept of being able to realize a photonic uh, Ising machine has been around for a long time. Um, you know the studies have gone back to back to 2011. Um, so in order to realize a physical uh, system, you require two things. One is the binary degree of freedom, and you also want reconfigurable coupling. So you know there there's been a lot of work done on coupled laser systems. Uh, there's been people that have worked on, uh, you know, a fiber based, um, uh, degenerate, uh, optical parametric oscillator. And also, um, recently, um, optoelectronics, uh, oscillators with cell feedback, spatial light modulators and dispersive optical biostabilities as well. So, in our approach, um, we use, uh, um, a Chi 3 optical parametric oscillator and a silicon nitride, uh, silicon nitride microresonator. Um, so here's kind of a concept illustration. So you basically generate all the different OPOs in the rings. And then the coupling is done through spatial multiplexing using these, uh, array of coupling waveguides. So, you know, we, we've considered a, a, a two OPO system. So in this case, we have an uncoupled system where, um, where uh, we, we start with a, a pump that's sent into the device. Um, the, the, the power is split using a multi-mode interference splitter and sent into OPO1 and OPO2. Um, so each of the microresonators, again, can be thermally controlled using the integrated heaters. And uh, that actually allows for simultaneous oscillation of OPO1 and OPO2, like shown in the bottom. So here's the setup for characterizing the system. So this is very similar to the original um, uh, OPO demonstration that we showed earlier. So um, we we modulate one of the, the um, one of the pumps using an acoustic optic modulator, uh, so that we can characterize the successive OPO runs. So for each pump pulse, what we can do is measure the individual OPO output shown here and here, and also the interference between the two OPOs uh, um, using this interferometer, uh, free space interferometer, uh, shown here in the middle. So uh, here's the, the temporal measurements. So the, the top one shows the interference and then the individual OPOs. And you can see, you know, when, when you have no coupling uh, between the two, um, you see independent oscillations that are generating these uncorrelated biphase states. So then now um, we develop a chip that has a, a coupling waveguide in between. Um, so what we can do is, you know, also using integrated heaters, uh, con uh, by thermally tuning the, the waveguide, you can uh, configure the system to have in-phase or out-of-phase coupling. So um, the, the setup for measuring the interference is the same as before. So I just want to point out here that the interference in this case now corresponds to a solution of, uh, you know, a two OPO Ising system. So uh, here's our interference measurement. Um, on the right here, I show the coupling phase diagram. So for the top plot, we configure in this pink region. Um, uh, and what we're able to do is get in phase operation between the two OPOs, which shows up as constructive interference. The middle one, um, we operate in the blue region here, and um, we're actually able to operate um, out of phase operation between the two OPOs, um, and that shows up as destructive interference here, right? And then the bottom shows op uh, operation kind of in this transition region where you can see the oscillations actually uh, kind of frustrated and uncorrelated. Um, so we zoom into the, the, the pulses for in-phase operation in this case. Um, and each of the pulses in this case, again, shows the interference between the two OPOs that are generated, um, which is, you know, again, the solution of the two OPOs uh, Ising system. So in this system, we're able to actually get a pretty fast convergence time of about 120 nanoseconds 
and the computing rate, which is the repetition rate of the pulses, which is 400 kilohertz. So we've also performed some modeling, modeling of the degenerate OPO. Um, we can do this using a coupled Lugiato Lefebvre equation. Uh, so this is kind of similar to the original Kirkholm modeling, except now we have a, a, a dual pump here. And this, this, this kappa term E1 corresponds to the coupling between the, the two OPOs. So here's the simulation, um, just very similar to the experiment. We're able to get in phase operation for a, a coupling phase of minus 70 to 70 degrees here. Um, you see outer phase behavior for you know coupling phases between 110 and 250 degrees. And then uh, again, similar to the experiment, we get this um, you know uncorrelated regime when we operate in the transition region. So we've uh, um, actually extended our modeling to a system of 100 OPO. And in this case, we can simulate a, a max cut problem of under, undirected graphs with 100 nodes. Uh, this, this is a configuration that's known as the Mobius ladder graph. And it's been used as a, a benchmark problem for evaluating the performance of you know, various uh, physical photonic guising machines. The plot in this case shows the, the signal power, the signal phase, and also the Ising Hamiltonian for uh, 100 coupled OPOs. And you can see from the evolution of the, the Ising Hamiltonian that the system indeed is uh, attempting to minimize the overall energy, meaning that the, you know, the, the Ising machine is working. Um, so the, our simulation uh, shows an annealed time of about 200 nanoseconds um, with a success probability of 0.35. So this corresponds to a time to solution of uh, 2.1 microseconds, in the, uh, indicating that our system uh, com uh, compares fairly uh, favorably to state-of-the-art electronic and digital systems. So you know, um, so we've been able to develop a building building block uh, towards the chip scale Ising machine. Um, you know, the bottom in this case shows a fabricated uh, four OPO chip where we basically have a series of Moxender um, uh, interferometers to do the reconfigurable coupling. And we also think that this could be a, a pretty intriguing platform for being able to study the, the coupled OPO dynamics in the presence of quantum effects. So uh, last, I just wanted to thank all the different um, you know, group members from both uh, Alex uh, Guided group and Michal Lipton's group that have contributed to this work and also all, all of our funding um, uh, funding agents, and uh, thanks very much, everybody, for your attention. Thanks. Very good about us. Thank you, Yoshi, um, for a very nice talk. Our work that's happening. Among the two groups. Uh, so there's some uh, so there's some your voice is a bit nice. You can check. Yeah. Sorry. Can you hear me better now? Or... Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Yoshi, for a nice talk. Um, a lot of work that you've covered. Um, I think that's happening in stages over seventy years. Uh, so uh, the stage is open for questions. I have several in the Q&A box. Um, please type in your questions in the Q&A box. I take them in the order they were typed. Um, the first question is from Nagarajan. Uh, it says, uh, in the normal GVD case, uh, beta 4 plays a major role in the four-way mixing process. So what is the value of beta-4 in the proposed home generation? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I actually can't remember the exact value of beta-4 for our case, but, um, you know, so for, I, I guess what, what can happen is if you, if you operate in the regime where beta-2 is very small, right, then you can get, you know, phase matching uh, to to allow for these like really far away sidebands to generate through the beta four phase matching, but in in this case um, we're operating in the regime where you know for example beta two is larger than um, uh, one hundred 
picoseconds squared per kilometer. So like it's it's a quite a large value. So in that case, um, you know the the dominant contribution to the the dispersion is um, P2. Um, so in 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 the regime that we're operating in, beta four doesn't really play much of a role. I hope that answers your question. Uh, so we have our in-house PhD student who is working on homes on the town with the questions. Uh, he has about three questions per one. Uh, I'll try to pick a few, but uh, I think this uh, is a good platform to perhaps uh, engage on this discussion even offline. So, Pranitha, you should probably try and catch up um, offline if we don't have time to cover all these. So, I'll take up some of these. Um, so, we have uh, many materials. So, you showed a lot of materials that are being used for uh, home generation, right? So, silicon nitride, uh, silicon carbide, nitride. Um, you see the clear winner right now uh, what what are the material properties that you think is uh, um, thing that occur from generators yeah so i i you know i i think in terms of integration um you know a lot of the platforms on the bottom for example silicon nitride aluminum nitride um lithium nitride like it, it, there, there's also been you know some other new platforms as well um that it's it's eluding me right now in my, in my mind but like you know silicon nitride has become very well developed um but uh you know like i i guess in terms of i guess it really depends on the application um you know if you're operating in the mid infrared for example you you you, you want to go to silicon just because of the transparency window um or even you know maybe silicon geranium or so forth right um if if you want to consider doing you know like simultaneous f to two f interferometry for example if you have a very broad comb you know uh, aluminum nitride and lithium niobate might be a nice platform um just because of the inherent chi two um you know uh, we since we work on silicon nitride i'll i'll, I'll vouch for silicon nitride in terms of you know the in, in terms of the the losses that have been achieved and you know the a lot of the Kind of knowledge in terms of being able to couple in, in and out of the device and so forth. Um, so, so I I, I I guess you know in terms of platforms, I I feel like those are kind of the the ideal ones to go with. Um, but you know there there's there's still um, further development happening even on the other uh, you know some of the newer platforms as well. So, I, I I'm not so sure. It, it's you know that I, I guess ultimately um, what will win out is whatever that can be actually you know developed and processed in a foundry, for example. Right. So right. I think that's still to be seen. Right, because I think calcium fluoride, I think, still holds the record for a cube, right? Yeah. Maybe or something. Uh, but in terms of on chip, I think it's probably nitride. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. Um, so the next question, um, actually there are a few that she's targeting on, on, on just analyzing these forms. So let's start with the first one, which is the LLE equation, the PR and the power equation. Um, what kind of tools do you use to do those numerical simulations? Um, okay. So the, the question for numerical modeling. Yeah. So. So I, I mean, I, I personally use MATLAB, um, but you know, like you can, you know, there are, our, our group also uses Python. Um, I, I mean, they're, they're, since, since you're largely for most of these uh, simulations, since you're using um, um, the, the split step Fourier method, the, it's not as computationally intensive, you know, like I, I, of course, when you start incorporating, um, you know, chi two nonlinearities, for example, then um, it, it becomes a little bit more intensive, and you can't, you no longer can use the split step method to do, do it directly. So you know, but um, largely you could just do it on you know a typical you know laptop or something. So it's not too intense. Sort of, I mean, separates from my understanding the envelope 
of the quantitative field from the actual electric field that's fluctuating with the terahertz, right? So yeah. You don't have the regular issue of trying to discretize that the optical frequency times the scale. Yeah, and, and you know, just another key for this is, you know, just, just because um, you can also um, take advantage of um, what's known as the mean field approach. So, you know, you, you can kind of assume that the, the round trip phase shift is pretty small, so you can, um, you know, you, you can also incorporate the coupling and the uh, coupling terms into the, the, the propagation equation. So, it's, it, it, that also helps to reduce the um, uh, the number of steps that you need to, uh, to converse to a solution as well. The next one is an interesting one. She's asking what's the origin of the carrier envelope of You can see. Oh, um, so that that's basically just the um, you know I, I guess it's, it's it it also arises from the difference in the phase and groove velocity. Um, so it, it's just kind of the phase flip that you get um, in the pulses as you you know propagate um, you know through the cavity. Okay. Um, so that's the question. Sorry, I'm trying to read thinking. Um, so she wants to understand this concept of modulation instability. Uh, what's the reason of physical phenomena that is responsible for modulation instability? Oh, so you know, so it, it's a. I, I guess you can think of it as a spontaneous uh, forward mixing effect. So, you know, it, it's basically, um, you know, it, essentially modulation instability occurs because, you know, you're, you're in the right uh, dispersion regime such that you, you annihilate two pump photons and create this signal annihilator. So, um, so it, it's basically, you know, the, 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 the signal in either pair being generated from noise. Um, it's question. So she asks if there's any uh, uh, interest, research interest in the multiple soliton states, um, perhaps filtering out these independent solitons and studying them. Is there any use uh, in that direction, studying the uh, multiple soliton region? Yeah, um, so so there, there's been a lot of work, um, you know, one, one that immediately comes to mind is the, the NIST group um, actually uses you know, mode interactions to actually specifically control, um, you know, how many, like, control how many solitons can be, can be generated. So, um, depending on the, the position of the, the mode interaction or the, the strength, you can, you know, th this is also work that was done by um, Andrew Weiner's group as well, um, where you can control, you know, how many solitons are propagating inside. Um, in terms of application, you know, like I, I guess one of the nice things is if you take a look in the spectral domain, you know, a multi soliton state inherently has more power. Um, so for some of the applications, for example, for F to two F, um, you know, where where you require you know more more power for doing the the interferometry, um, or you know, for even for uh, I guess even for data comm applications, there might be some. In, um, Something there in terms of using a multi soliton state, um, just because you have more enhanced power in the coal mines. But um, I'm not sure if there's been specific applications, at least that I'm aware of, that have been demonstrated with it. Because the R of noise is quite low even in those states, right? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is pertaining to the specific slide. She says, could you explain the frequency versus detuning plot uh, in the generation dynamics slide? Huh. Um, I guess. Can you uh, mute uh, if, 
can remember which slide phones are. Is it for this one or is it for the normal GVD call? Maybe we should start struggling to get on the mic. Um, we can probably go to our next question. Um, so, is there um, any work going on right now in terms of manipulating the third and fourth order dispersion? to enhance the storm generation process? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess I didn't mention it today. Um, so maybe what I could do, I'm not sure if I slide on this. Yeah, so so what, what happens when you, um, when you consider, you know, higher order dispersion is what you can do is excite um, what are known as dispersive waves. So the, these are, you know, they're they're, they're also known as, um, you know, Trenikov radiation. So the, right. it's basically a phase match process to generate, you know, uh, a, a narrow uh, resonance peak, if you will, at a, you know, far away position. So, you know, particularly for doing, you know, very broad combs like octopus and Kerr combs, for example, the presence of these dispersive waves are really important, um, just because. You know, it, it actually allows you to spectrally, um, you know, broaden the, the wings typically where you want to do um, uh, stabilization, uh, for example. So, um, and that that's really dependent on beta three, beta four, um, kind of like the higher order dispersion terms. So, being able to, you know, precisely engineer the waveguide dispersion such that you have. Um, you know, the dispersive waves occurring at a specific location is pretty critical. And, you know, since, since there's, there's on the, on the wafer scale, there's a lot of variation in the, um, film, film thickness that you can fabricate. Right. Um, so you, you require a lot of, um, you know, mapping of that particular wafer, for example, or, or being able to have a lot of different devices so that, you know, you can actually get the right dispersion profile on the given chip. So. Um, you know, so, yeah, so for cert certainly being able to, you know, uh, uh, repeatedly being able to generate, uh, you know, the delivered devices that can do that, I think is, is a current challenge. Um, so the next question is from Shashan. How does the application complexity scale for the on-chip uh, DOPO, digital DOPO? Is coherent icing machine increasing number of spins? Yeah. Uh, so, so currently, you know, we we we've scaled up and we're working on like a four OPO chip, like that I showed at the very end. But um, you know, th this is similar to w w what I mentioned about the um, you know, finding the right device to do optus uh, optus spanning Kirkcombs as well. I guess. Um, you know, like in in terms of even within a you know a, a centimeter or chip, the you know the, even if you fabricate identical resonators, there's going to be the variations in the FSR that come from the fact that you know there's there's height variations or you know within the fabrication tolerance, right? So, no, it certainly is a is a challenge um um being able to go to a large number, and you know perhaps there's um. Maybe other approaches that you can you can think about to be able to you know um, kind of to to have uh, more consistent uh, I, I guess more consistent FSR devices or maybe other ways of being able to generate um, the the OPOs itself. Um, so that's that's still something that we're thinking about just because you know I, I mean for for sure being able to scale to you know. 100 OPOs, it sounds quite challenging in this particular platform. So there must be a more elegant approach to be able to do this. And we're, we're currently still thinking about that. Um, I had a question regarding this application today. Uh, so these are about 700 nanometer thick money chart. Right? So, yeah. Uh, you grow them in house, Columbia. Uh, so this is this is work done um, by by Mihal Lipson Group. So they 
they they do the 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 growth at um yeah nanofabrication uh nanofabrication facility yeah. mm -hmm. so okay so all the, all their tricks to not getting any impacts on the programs um, yeah the, the I, I guess the technical details are probably a good idea to refer to them <laughs> did you hear about the work from Letty recently on trying to grow nitride in stacks, the twist and throw method. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. I, I think you know one one of the one of the things with nitride is there's a lot of stress, so it's it, it's it's quite different from some of the other materials where you can you know, um, you can just like, um, you, you can just do it in one shot. So, um, there there are certain challenges in terms of being able to you know get to the right thickness just because of, of the stress. So. You know the the details of the tricks that that are used, <laughs> kind of beyond my pay grade, but um, yeah. So I see uh, Arnav turned on this video. Do you have any questions? Yeah, okay, I have a question regarding the stability of the ring resonance. So when you, when you operate high power, did you face anything, any problem with the drifting of the resonance, or how, uh, how will you stabilize it, like at high power particularly? Actually. So that, that's that's a, re a really good question. Um, so it, it it's actually more unstable at uh, low power. Um, just be, so the you know the environmental fluctuations can potentially make the the resonances drift. Um, you know on the order of tens of megahertz, maybe even a hundred megahertz. Um, but as you operate at high power, especially when you're operating in the um on the the blue side of the resonance, I guess, what, what you get is uh, what's known as um, soft thermal lock. So basically the, the, the laser power inside the cavity essentially makes the, the, the resonance kind of stay at that, the right position. Because if the resonance shifts a certain direction, then the, you know, the pump power enhances the shift it back. Or like, you know, if it goes the other way, then, you know, the, um, it, essentially, the, the 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 pump cavity detuning ends up getting fixed in that way, um, and yeah, so it, it it actually is fairly stable, particularly at higher pump power, um, at least in silicon nitride. So so there are you know in other platforms there are other other issues. You know, like there's uh, for silicon there's 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 carriers. Um, you know, so you can it'll also kind of restrict the um, and so that, that actually induces actual losses as well. Um, or in lithium niobate, for example, there's photorefractive effects. So, you know, so those, those add out on different stability. So, you know, so there different materials have different, um, the origins of fluctuations. So it's not universal, but, you know, at least in silicon nitride, um, the large, largely the effects are thermal. So, um. You know, I, I guess I should clarify it also depends on what you're doing. Um, you know, just because for some some applications that even that level of thermal fluctuations become quite an issue. So Uh, I'm not sure if I lost people. 